If you're looking for insights into how to automate your Western workflow, you're in the right place. This webinar, aptly titled, Think You've Automated Your Western Workflow, will provide tips on how to truly automate the Western process, eliminating the need to run a protein gel or deal with messy blots. I'm Tamlin Oliver, Managing Editor of Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology News, and I'll be the moderator for this webinar. Our two speakers today, Katherine Hoffler, Director of Research at Emerald Therapeutics, and Andrea Tu, Application Scientist at Protein Simple, will talk about how the Simple Western platform integrates and automates all manual operations associated with Western blotting. They will also address how the Simple Western platform can be integrated into a fully automated process that includes liquid handling, protein quantification, and sample preparation. Andrea will get the presentation started, but before she starts, I want to encourage you to submit questions for our Q&A session at the end of the presentations. We'll answer as many questions as we can. Simply type your question into the Ask a Question box and hit Submit. Okay, Andrea, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone, and thanks again for joining us for this presentation on automating your Western blot. Like Tamlin said, my name's Andrea, and I am an application scientist here at Protein Simple. And when I tell people I'm a scientist, that means a lot of different things to different people. So my friends think I am in the lab blowing things up all the time. My mother, despite all the times I've tried to convince her otherwise, thinks I'm the type of doctor that treats patients. My coworkers, when they come to the lab, think that all I do for my job is transfer liquids from tube to tube. I think I'm answering important scientific questions that are going to change the fabric of our society but at the end of the day, what I really am is a lab rat. And as a lab rat, I've definitely run my share of Western blots. So as you can see from a paper that I published in graduate school, I've run a lot of Western blots. And with each Western blot, it took two days for me to get results. And for each result, there was a lot of manual handling where I was essentially glued to a timer waiting for when it was time to start my transfer, when I had to go wash the blot, when I needed to go and add my primary and do the detection. So it was an extremely tedious process. And with each step, there was a lot of manual handling that could add variability so that at the end of the day, my reproducibility from experiment to experiment was not always quite what I hoped it would be. And what that meant was for a lot of experiments, I would need to repeat each experiment three or four times just to ensure that whatever result I was seeing was actually a real result and not an artifact of this technique. And I remember while I was sitting at my bench, rolling a pipette over my transfer, praying that I'd gotten every single bubble out, that there had to be a better way. And so at Protein Simple, we found that better way by introducing the world to West, the gel-free, blot-free, hands-free, simple Western assay. And what a simple Western assay is, is essentially an automated Western block that's done in a capillary. So the assay setup is extremely easy. You essentially pipette your reagents that are specific to your assay on the top of a plate that we provide. So this would include your sample and your primary antibody. And Catherine, in a little bit, is going to go through the steps that her group at Emerald Therapeutics has gone through to actually automate this process as well. At the bottom of the plate, we have pre-filled the plate with the reagents that you would need with every single experiment, such as the separation matrix, stacking matrix, and running buffer, so you don't have to do that every single time, cutting back on some of the hands-on work that you would need to do for each experiment. This plate takes about a half an hour to set up, and at the end, you just put in the plate into the instrument with a capillary cartridge that contains 25 capillaries per cartridge, hit start, walk away. And the great thing is, in three hours, you come back to automatically um, analyze results where the software will generate peak areas, peak heights for you. So you know more of this going through each gel and drawing boxes around your bands of interest. The software automatically does that for you cutting time in the analysis portion of the experiment as well. So what exactly happens after you press start? Like I said, 
simple Western assay is essentially a immunoassay done in a five centimeter capillary. So what happens is the instrument will load separation matrix, stacking matrix, and your sample into a capillary. It then will apply an electric voltage so that your proteins will electrophoretically separate based on the molecular weight. And then we will capture the protein to the capillary wall. And this immobilization step is essentially the step that separates us from other traditional CE technologies because what it enables us to do is glue the protein to the capillary wall so that we can remove things that haven't captured, such as the separation matrix and stacking matrix, at the end of the immobilization, and then flow primary antibody that's specific to your protein of interest, followed by a HRP-labeled secondary antibody, which results in a chemiluminescent detection after you flow luminal peroxide through your, cap your capillary. So everything on this slide is stuff that the instrument does for you. But what does this mean for you, right? Well, essentially 30 minutes of hands-on time to run a complete experiment compared to traditional Western blot where it can take two or three hours of hands-on time. Three hours of time to result as opposed to two days, which will exponentially increase your time to publish can get 25 data points per run and automated data analysis for you. And with, with all of this automation, you remove a lot of manual variability, so at the end of the day, you get fantastic data. So what you're looking at here is technical replicates, so replicates where we ran the same sample 24 times in an experiment, and what you can see is that the data looks beautiful. And when you quantitate that data, our CVs are exceptional. CV is under 10% and 4.4% for PI3 kinase. And what this precision enables you to do is make better decisions about your research. So this was actually samples that a customer asked us to run where they sent us biological replicates and asked us to run technical replicates. So biological replicates were independent samples that are treated the same way but different uh, tissue. And what you can see is when you look at the vehicle versus their treated sample, due to the tightness of our data, you can actually see that their drug treatment is statistically relevant, as opposed to a traditional Western blot where the data tightness has so much variability that it's hard to make good conclusions as to the efficacy of their drug. The software, the instrument is really easy to use. So this was data taken this January when we trained our sales reps on how to use the instrument. And a lot of these sales reps either have never pipetted in their entire lives or had pipetted for the first time in 10 years. And what we were really gratified to see is even people who don't pipette every day as part of their living were able to get excellent CVs. So all of the CVs for each experiment were under 10%. And when you look at the average of the data between eight different first-time users and eight different instruments, we had an average of 9.4%, demonstrating really the precision of the technology. So what you can see is you get extremely reproducible data within an experiment. So this was actually an experiment where we're looking at the presence of autoantibodies in lupus patient serum. So what we did was we separated and captured antigens that are known to be prevalent in lupus and then exposed those capillaries to either serum from normal patients or lupus patients. What you're seeing here is technical replicates. So each serum sample is run in three different capillaries. And we also ran a system control. So this is another feature of Simple Western that we provide to help with your reproducibility and your precision for your quantitation where we have a molecule that we have added to a specific one of our reagents so that it will be pre present in all of your samples. And what that enables us is to use that as a normalization control for your, for your instrument. So we, when we normalize the detection of our autoantigen in our patient serum to the system control, you can see that within an experiment, we're getting CVs all under 13%, which is pretty incredible when you think about 
the type of results you get with a Western blot, especially when you're working with serum samples where there's a lot of background. Not only that, when you reproduce this experiment three times, you also see the excellent reproducibility from experiment to experiment. So looking at the quantitation, you can see that the results trend almost exactly the same from between three different experiments. And when you look at the actual quantitation, if you look at the CVs, CVs between three experiments were under 12%, which is pretty incredible. But how does simple Western compare to the digital Western? So that's what we set out to do in this experiment. We took jerkit cell lysates, which contain endogenous AKT1 and spiked in different levels of GST tagged AKT1 into the sample. Because the AKT1 that we spiked in was tagged, it focused at a higher molecular weight than our endogenous, which enabled us to look at both in one capillary. And then if you take the GST tagged AKT and use that to generate a standard curve, A, you can look at the um, the standard deviation for each point when you look at an N of 3 between simple Western and traditional Western. You can then use this standard curve to interpolate the amount of endogenous AKT in the jerkit cell lysate. And when you look at those numbers, you can see that the interpolated amount in West was 29 picograms per microliter, whereas in traditional Western it was 12.5. But if you look at the range between all 24 capillaries, you can see that the range in West is much tighter compared to traditional Western. So when you look at the interpolated AKT in West, the range of every single data point was between 6.1 to 21.3 picograms per microliter, whereas traditional Western, we had such a huge spread, we were getting numbers in between 6.2 to 20.2 picograms per microliter, that how can you really trust the interpolated data with traditional Western? And if you quantitate that CV, you can see that between West, we had a CV of 9.4% when you look at the interpolated endogenous AKT level, and with traditional Western, it was 34.5%, really demonstrating how much better West is at giving you absolute quantitation of your results. Not only that, with an addition, with in addition to the decreased hands-on time and decreased time to results, WES is also more sensitive than many simple West, traditional Western bots. So if we look at the theoretical LOD, WES had a theoretical LOD of 1.0 picogram per microliter compared to traditional Western at 3.4 picograms per microliter. And so with this additional precision, what this really enables you to do is have more confidence in your data and also more confidence in results you see between person to person, lab to lab, and site to site. And on top of that, we've added a system control to give you even more confidence in your data. Now, WES is not the only instrument we have that um, in our simple Western family. We have multiple instruments all with similar capabilities. So we have Sally Sue, which is our size separation, but it's just a little more high throughput version of West, where you can get 96 capillaries per run. West, which we just went over, again, our size separation technology with 25 capillaries per run. And we have Peggy Sue, which can run both size and charge separation in different runs, again, with the high throughputness of Sally Sue. So if you'd like to learn more, please visit us at our Simple Western website. There's a lot of information here as well as technical um, information to tell you about our capabilities. And I'd like to end by just telling you, we released this instrument in the beginning of January, and the response has been incredible. Everybody loves WES, to the point where at a trade show we were at, we had someone come by the booth, and when we told her what WES was, she couldn't help but kiss the instrument because she loved it so much. And so WES is really a much better technology compared to a traditional Western because it decreases the amount of time you have to spend per experiment, gives you results much faster, and not only that, gives you much more precise, reducible, reproducible, and quantitative results. And so I really thank you for all your time um, listening and 
uh, look forward to hearing your questions. Back to you, Tamlin. Thanks, Andrea. Are you sure that's not your mom kissing Wes? Um, anyway. So if I'm adopted. <laughs> okay. Uh, before we move on to Catherine's presentation, I want to remind you once again about submitting questions through the Ask a Question box. Andrea and Catherine will answer as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation. Catherine, the floor is yours. So as Tamlin said, I'm Catherine. I'm the director of research at a small biotech company called Emerald Therapeutics. And I'm going to tell you about how we've incorporated Simple Western into an automated solution for running biological experiments, you know, hopefully simplifying the science through using engineering. So you might imagine Emerald Therapeutics is a different kind of biotech company. We use an engineering approach, automated instruments and robotics, including Simple Westerns, and a software platform that we've built in Mathematica and using a MySQL database to uh, store all of our data and run all of our experiments. And this allows us to have increased reproducibility, increased scalability, and virtualization of all of our experiments. And this allows us to have a, t a research team of only three people who are exploring such complicated uh, biological pathways like apoptosis. We're doing this because we believe that traditional research and development models have a few problems. In a typical biotech lab, you have a principal investigator who oversees the grand vision of the project or the company uh, goals. That principal investigator works with several scientists who take those grand visions, develop particular experiments, and have research associates to carry out those experiments for them. Oftentimes, these research associates are working with just a few instruments each. They have their, they're very specialized. They have their expertise. And then as they're carrying out these experiments, they may make decisions on the fly uh, about how the experiment is actually being carried out. So the resulting data gets passed back up to the scientists from the research associates, who then further filter that data by maybe uh, not passing on data that, is, uh, that shows a lack of reproducibility, or not passing on false results. So the principal investigator at the end of the day gets a much rosier view of the science than may actually exist. In this case, uh, the principal investigator can still uh, oversee the grand vision, but they lack the control over de the experimental design, and they also lack all of the information about the picky details of how the experiment was run, and may even lack some of the, the data that came out of the experiment. Uh, and this, unfortunately, leads to a pretty big problem that the majority of data in the literature can't actually be reproduced faithfully. Uh, data from about 10 top pharmaceutical companies showed that only 25 to 30 percent of data published in the literature is completely reproducible. So when they took these papers, they tried to completely reproduce the experiments by following the directions in the methods section. Uh, most of the time, there were inconsistencies. And this is not uh, something malicious. Uh, from the scientists who are publishing this, these uh, papers, but likely a consequence of the inexact nature of the summary communication presented in papers. There just isn't enough room to put in all the details and information. So we'd like to change that. And as part of this, we've developed a, a software package called the Symbolic Lab Language, which is a computational system for managing experimental workflows. And this allows us to increase reproducibility, scalability, and virtualization. So as the director of research at Emerald, I have the power to both oversee all of the, the grand vision of my research goals and also um, control the piggy details of the experiment. I, I have the gamut of uh, overview here. So when I want to design an experiment, like running a simple Western, for example, I talk directly to our server and I put in, I have the power to put in all of the piggy details. From that server, that information is available to operators who follow strict protocols when carrying out these uh, instructions on any, any number of instruments. And all of the operators are trained, and the protocols are simple enough to follow, that they can use any instrument in our lab. So any person in the, in the company can run any experiment. And all of those picky details are set by the researcher who's asking for the experiment um, so even if we ask somebody else to redo this experiment tomorrow, all of those details will be there, and hopefully the experiment will be carried out in exactly the same way. 
So these experiments obviously produce data, which is also loaded onto the server, where then I have direct access to it again. And I don't have access to just the data that the operators think is the best data. I have access to all of the data. I can make the final decision based on all of the data, all of the replicates, all of the experiments uh, as to what the next step to do is. And in addition to this system of working with the server directly, having operators who carefully carry out protocols, we also have uh, automated experimentation and data analysis. So most of the time the operators aren't pipetting, uh, they aren't doing the bulk of the actual work, they are setting up robotic instruments that are doing the uh, picky liquid handling bits of the experiments. And this allows us to have even more control and more reproducibility in terms of experimentation. So now I'm going to show you how we would run a simple Western using our system. Our SLL enables the simple, the simple Western workflow to be super fast, very hands-off, even more so than just running West, which, as Andrea showed, is very hands-off in its own way. Uh, and it, uh, our system makes everything very easy as well. So the first thing I would do is design my experiment. And again, I have control over any picky details that I would like, and I uh, push these detailed experimental instructions to the server. The robots then actually talk directly to the server in the database, follow the instructions that I've prepared to uh, set up the assay plate for WES, and then an operator would take that assay plate, load it into the instrument, and press the go button. Once the run is done three hours later, the data is pushed back to the server where I have access to it, and I can use automated uh, functions in the SLL, the symbolic lab language, to analyze my data and find the results. I'm just going to give you a very quick overview of some of the nomenclature that we're using so it's not confusing, uh, but please don't get hung up on the syntax or anything. It's not important at all. Um, the basic idea is that we store information in objects each with a unique identifying key. So we might have a sample object that represents a tube of antibody in the lab. So for example, sample, number, uh, sample antibody number 67 would be represented like this. The sample bracket, the unique key, and then comma antibody to say that it's a, a particular antibody sample. We also have objects that represent uh, plates, a uh, 96 well plate. You store all the information about what's in each well, or uh, objects about processes, instruments, basically everything. We objectify everything. Um, so now let's run a simple Western in SLL. This is a very easy thing to do. I'm actually going to show you a little video of me live typing out all of the instructions that I would want to do if I was going to run an experiment in SLL. And uh, we're interested in studying apoptosis at Emerald Therapeutics. So I'm going to set up a simple Western on some protein samples where I had treated the cells with an apoptosis-inducing drug beforehand, and I'm going to probe them with uh, anti-cleaved PARP antibody. So PARP cleavage increases during apoptosis. I'm also going to multiplex with a GAP-DH antibody as a loading control. So I'm going to probe all of my samples with the same two antibodies. So the first thing that I'm going to do in setting up my simple Western is to find the antibody samples that I want to use. So I'm just going to search through the database using our software system for sample antibodies that are the anti-cleaved PARP antibody or the anti-GAPS-DH antibody and that are also active in our system, meaning that they're actually downstairs in the freezer ready to go. We can actually use them for this particular experiment. So this search command is just going to actually look up in the database and find these particular antibody samples that I want to use. And when this evaluates, we'll have our two antibody samples. And we can look at all of the information that is stored in these antibody objects just by viewing them. We can see all of the picky details of everything that we know about these antibodies, including when they were ordered, how long they've been active, what experiments have been used to run uh, uh, using them, the amount of liquid that's been transferred out of each tube. If experiments have been run, we can see the data that was produced using these antibodies. Next, I'll need to gather my protein samples. So cooking show style, I've already done a protein prep using the robot. I ran process number 10 protein prep 
to generate the protein lysates of my uh, apoptosis drug uh, treated cells. So because all of the samples are associated with that process, I can just pull the sample objects directly out of that process that I had previously ran. This process was run on the robot. The robot lysed the cells for me and quantified them so I, I know the amount of protein lysate that I have here. In addition, I want to just point out that all of the run parameters, the optimized run parameters for running a simple Western using these antibodies and these protein samples are actually stored in our database as well. So down at the bottom there, you can see simple Western options, uh, which have the optimized dilution values and loading times and perhaps incubation times for each and every antibody. So when it comes time to actually push my instructions to the server, I just I compile them. I compile a process simple Western with my proteins and my antibodies that I've found using the search and by pulling the proteins out of the process object. And this is going to generate a set of instructions for the robot to prepare my protein samples and set up the WAS assay plate. And in addition, it's going to generate the uh, assay file that I will load into the WAS software. And so if I actually view this Western uh, protocol that I've created, I can see that all of the piggy details have been uh, generated in here. And I've just used all of the default settings, which means that when I ran this code, it actually looked up into those antibody samples to find all the optimal settings like the dilution and the loading time for all of my antibodies, and it used those parameters to generate these set of instructions. If I had wanted to maybe change something, not use the default settings and the optimal settings, I can very easily do that. I can look up um, what kind of things can I change by looking at our, the help file in our documentation system. So this will tell me exactly the kind of inputs that I need to put into the compile to generate the process, and it will give me a list of all the things that I have control over, all of the things that I can change. So I can change the dilution of the antibodies that are loaded into the plate. I can change the volume of the sample that's loaded into the plate, and I can change all sorts of incubation times and everything. Now, to actually run this experiment, we would hand off this process to an operator. They would execute the process. And again, this protocol is written in code. So the uh, pops open a helpful little window where we have detailed instructions of what everyone needs to do, including piggy details about the personal safety equipment that we need to, do, to use, how to set up the robot. Uh, and if an operator isn't sure of what to do on any of these steps, the green text is actually a quick link, quick help links, which will pop open images and pictures to help an operator through a process if it's maybe the first time they've been running it or if they forget. Additionally, in the, this protocol, I can specify any particular details that were not specified at the time that I uh, pushed the set of instructions to the server. So if I don't care what uh, West assay plate we actually use, I can just say, use any of them and the operator will choose. In the protocol, there are also detailed instructions about how to set up the robotic deck, as you just saw, including information about how much volume to make sure is in each well in each plate on the robot deck. So once the operator has followed the detailed instructions in the protocol, the simple Western assay plates are actually prepared by a robotic liquid handler. In our lab, we have a Hamilton star who talks directly to our database to follow the detailed instructions that I put there to tell it exactly how to pipette the protein samples, the antibodies, all of the reagents into the West assay plate. We can control and watch the robot using a bunch of different methods. We can use virtual network computing to actually look at the monitor and see the software running live, uh, the, uh, the robotic software. We can use power distribution units to turn on and off various devices. So if we have a recirculating pump that pumps cold water through a, one of the deck um, carriers on the robot, we can turn that on and off during the process. And we can also use drop cams to just watch what the robot is doing live, watch every single pipetting action. Once our experiment is done, so, uh, after the operator has loaded the West assay plate into West and clicked the go button, we get our data back. Um, and as Andrea explained earlier, 
that we get that data back within three hours of starting this experiment, which is absolutely amazing. So and the results of our experiment, that data that was generated, is actually connected to the process that we just ran. So again, cooking show style, I have a simple Western process that I ran a couple months ago, process number 25 of simple Western. And if I ask for the data that was generated by that process, just, I ask the software to look up in the database, give me the data, and it will generate the list of data for me. I can take the data, and I can quickly plot it just by saying, plot my data, please. And there it is. So here is a series of spectra generated by Wes, and you can see everything is overlaid on top of each other, but we've got a nice legend listing out the data object describing each of the spectra. Since that's a little hard to see, I can just change a couple of options, just add a little bit of more information into my plotting request, and it will plot them all individually. So we can see each individual spectra. We can see uh, very, the very tall peak around 35 kilodaltons, that's the GAP-DH peak, and we can see a smaller peak a little bit uh, higher in molecular weight, that is the cleaved part peak. And that, we can see, increases through our, our set of data and that's uh, correlating with the amount of drug that we treated the original cells with. Again, I can go in and, and view all of the information that is associated with one of these data objects. So I picked one um, that has, uh, we see has the two peaks, both GAP-DH and cleaved PARP. And in this data object, we store all of the information that from the WES software, all of the particular parameters that were used during the actual run. So if we wanted to repeat this exactly as is, we have all of this information stored in actually several places. And even if I mouse over some of the information here, like this, the raw spectra is stored in this data object, if I mouse over that raw spectra, it'll pop up in a little window and I can see the plot there. We can continue to analyze our data using automated systems. Uh, so at this point, we've decided to um, take our data and put it, pull it into a, the, our own system rather than using the uh, standard West software. But this allows us to analyze simple Western data or chromatography data or NMR data or any other kind of data that we're generating in the same exact system. So again, here's a, a plot of uh, some raw spectra from the simple Western. And we can see the two peaks, the GAP-DH and the cleaved park, PARP. And let's say I want to quantify the area of these peaks. I want to ask how much protein was actually detected. And I want to use that information to compare to my other experimental uh, samples where I treated with less apoptosis-inducing drugs. I can just analyze the peaks. And this will pop open a little applet where I can adjust settings. I can um, change where the baseline is. I can, if, if I need to, I can change... Um, the range of the x-axis to say we know simple westerns are best between 0 and uh, 200 kilodaltons, and, well, you can't have a protein that's less than 0 kilodaltons, so we can ignore the data that's below that. Um, but when I finish this analysis, all of that analysis goes directly to our database. And this, again, this software that we've developed not only can be used to analyze simple western data, but also other types of data. So this is a, a analytical page gel, so here's a ladder of DNA of different sizes, and we can generate a spectra of the uh, fluorescence staining that we see in the gel, and we can use the same peak picking software to pick the peaks for this ladder. So once we've picked our peaks from our simple western, we want to actually uh, find the conclusion of our experiment. If we treat with more drugs, do we actually see an increase in cleaved PARP, which is what we would expect. Because the results of the peak picking analysis are directly connected to the data object, we can just ask for the peak purity of our data object in question. So again, I've been uh, playing around with data of simple Western number 1101, and if I ask for the peak purity of that, it'll list it out. So I have the area of, of the two peaks in the background, uh, the percent area, and uh, some labels, peak number one, peak number two, background. I can plot this as a pie chart. Um, and again, I can just say plot the peaks that are in this data object. Everything is connected. And finally, when I go to plot my data again, just plotting the raw spectra, now because that peak picking analysis is linked to this data object, 
the more uh, things show up on the plot. I can see the peaks are represented by little dots at the height of their peaks. And if I mouse over that, like I've done here over the gap dh peak, it actually shows me the x-axis and y-axis values, so the molecular weight at which this peak is found and the height of that peak. If I mouse over the center of the peak off, I can also see the area. So let's actually do this analysis of, of this real experiment. So here I've got three samples that I've run in duplicate, West sample number one, number two, and number three. And these were treated with varying concentrations of my apoptosis-inducing drug. So I'm going to plot the peaks that are associated with this. I'm going to normalize the cleaved PARP peak to the GAF-DH peak. Again, I've multiplexed when I did my original experiment with both antibodies. I'm going to display the area of those two peaks normalized to each other. And I'm going to add a legend and some chart labels and maybe uh, a plot label, and I can play around with the size of the image that is generated. And all of this stuff, I could, if I didn't know exactly what to type in here, I would just go into the documentation system and ask it, how do I change the plot label? I want to label this a little bit differently. And find the answers there. So when I evaluate this, I generate a pretty bar chart, which shows me that uh, according to this data, again, I've normalized the cleaved PARP peak area to the GAF-DH peak area in each sample and averaged the replicates. I can see that when I increase the apoptosis-inducing drug star of fluorine, I see an increase in cleaved PARP levels. And that's what I expect to see. That's really exciting. So as I continue to generate data using these simple westerns, I can look at other proteins that are changed during apoptosis using the same cell lines, maybe even the same protein samples that were treated with the same drug conditions. And I can collect a whole pile of data that tells me a bigger story about the state of apoptosis in these particular cell samples. I can very easily share this data with the rest of my team and with my boss by creating a figure. And all I have to do to create a figure is I take that plotting call that I generated in the previous slide and I say parse this into a figure. I can add a title, I can add a caption or any detailed information that I want, and that pushes this figure to the database, again, as an object, so I get back report figure number 476, or 436. And then I can just email that object to my coworkers, uh, whoever would like to see it. When they visualize this object, they can see my beautiful, simple Western data. They can also appreciate that uh, when I've added this drug with increasing concentrations of the drug star sporine, we see increases in cleaved PARP, which is great. Uh, they can comment on my figure. They can like my figure if they want to. They can also use the action tab to find out what par experimental parameters were used during this process that I asked to be run. So they can click on the instrument button and find out which instrument was used, whether it was Wes or whether it was Simon or any other instrument uh, that we might have that runs Simple Western. They can see the data that was generated that I used to actually plot this figure, and also the analysis that was done on that data, the process that was run, everything. They can even look at the source code that I wrote. So if I press the source code button, now the code pile that I wrote a couple slides ago is right there. They can change things around. Maybe they want to view the, code, the figure in a slightly different way. They have the ability to do that. Maybe they want to zoom in on a particular part of the data. So this allows us to easily share the data that we generate using the Simple Western. Figures also allow us to connect very different types of data. So again, we're interested in using Simple Westerns to investigate apoptosis, but we also have a number of other assays that we use. So we can use Simple Westerns to look at the cleaved PARP uh, concentration in our treated cells. We can look at the state of the mitochondria, which uh, during apoptosis, the mitochondria burst. And we can look at the state of the cell wall during uh, late apoptosis and later uh, necrosis and other forms of cell death. The cell wall becomes permeable and dyes can uh, float into the cell itself, staining the uh, DNA inside. So all of these different types of assays or all of the different simple westerns that we've run with various antibodies, uh, with maybe with the same protein samples treated with the same drug or treated uh, different cells treated with different drugs, we can connect all of these things together and look at the bigger picture all at once. 
I also want to remind you that all of these objects are connected to, e to each other. So we can quickly browse from one object to the next. So if I ask to browse the data objects that I had been showing you before, data 1101 of Simple Western, it'll pop open a window. And this is connected to all of the, the protein samples that were used to generate this Simple Western, the antibody samples. So if I click on one of those protein samples, I can go back and see um, what kinds of processes were run to generate this protein sample. I can see where is this protein sample located in the lab. It's in the freezer in our tissue culture room. All of this information is, is stored uh, in our database, and we can easily click through these uh, data objects and sample objects to find all of this information. And this allows us, uh, as a very, very small team, to direct and investigate huge questions in biology, like apoptosis. So as I've shown you, um, the symbolic lab, symbolic lab language is a computational system for the management of experimental workflows and tons of data. And Simple Westerns are a huge part of this. Without West and without Simple Westerns, we would be stuck doing manual Western blots. Our oper operators would be very unhappy spending two days at a time tied to timers, as Andrea said, and our data would be significantly less reproducible and significantly less scalable. With West, we can do 24 assays and a ladder in three hours. And with the addition of our robotic setup, our hands-on time is five minutes. So I hope I've convinced you that by treating science as software and developing a system in which we can actually uh, treat the science as can code in, in an engineering manner, by using the laboratory as a machine, using all this automation, we can get increased reproducibility, scalability, and virtualization. It's as if we're using a lab in the cloud. And obviously, Simple Westerns fit very perfectly into our automated system. With that, I'd like to thank Protein Simple for allowing me to talk today. And thank you, Tamlin, for uh, moderating this session. Uh, back to you. Thank you very much, Catherine. Before we start the Q&A session, I want to give a final call on the questions for both of our panelists. I also want to let you know that a post-webinar survey will deploy shortly in the Presentation Manager. You might need to disable your pop-up blockers. Please take a few minutes and respond. Your questions are extremely valuable to us. Okay, let's start our Q&A session. We have a lot of really good questions, and we'll answer as many as we can. Andrea, our first question for you and we're diving right in. What happens if my target of interest overlaps with your loading control? Do you offer loading controls of different sizes to avoid obfuscation of data? Yes, so for our system control, we offer two sizes. So the one that was shown in the presentation um, had a molecular weight of 29 kilodaltons. For those looking at proteins around that weight, we also offer a system control at 180 kilodaltons. Okay, Andrea, how does phosphorylated protein versus unphosphorylated show in the results? So phosphorylated proteins and unphosphorylated proteins will co-migrate because the addition of a phospho group is not big enough to cause a big enough molecular weight shift. Um, so you can look at phosphorylated and unphosphorylated proteins using uh, phospho-specific antibodies, but you will need to do those in separate capillaries. However, one of the great things about the system is that if you look at the, if you remember what the capillaries look like, each capillary is an individual capillary. So it's essentially a different assay um, in each cap. So in one well, you could easily put um, a total antibody in one well and then a phospho antibody in another well. All right, Catherine, how can I tell if the antibody I'm currently using will work in a simple Western? Uh, oh, I think that's oh, I'm sorry, sorry, Andrea, that was for you. I'm sorry. No, um, so we do have an antibody database on our website at proteinsimple.com where we list antibodies that we ourselves internally as well as customers have used successfully on the instrument. And this is a really great resource to see if either the antibody you're looking for or the target you're interested in has a validated antibody already. All right, Catherine, now I have some questions for you. Um, is, the, is your software amenable to 21 CFR Part 11? Um, yes, it is, and we're trying hard, uh, very hard to make sh ensure that, that it is. 
Um, so the 21 CFR Part 11 is FDA regulations about uh, keeping data secure and um, making sure things are version tracked and that, that kind of thing, making sure that nobody can tamper, uh, tamper with the data. So all of our code is ac actually tracked in Git. So we can go back in time to previous versions and look at uh, changes that we've made in the past. All of our uh, notebooks that we generate in Mathematica are also Git tracked. So just like you, have, you may um, sign your notebook, your paper notebook at the end of the day, um, we just submit our notebooks to the Git tracking system, and this allows for our records of all previous history of those notebooks. All right, Catherine, I have one more question for you. What type of updates do you need to do for different instruments in the workflow, and how does this impact the Mathematica code? Right. Uh, so we recently upgraded from a Simon instrument to a WES, and I actually didn't have to do that much work uh, in order to uh, allow that upgrade to actually function properly in the system. So I created an instrument object that described WES, including information like the default running parameters that, were, that the instrument suggests, uh, and the fact that WES can have 25 capillaries, whereas Simon can only handle 12. Um, then I had to do some additional minor updates to make sure that, uh, and testing some antibodies to make sure that they still worked in the system. Once I was uh, confident of that, it was actually very easy to upgrade our automation to be able to handle the a different style of plates that Wes uses. Of course, having more capillaries means they need more wells. So uh, it was just a, a very easy um, creation of that new uh, assay plate and once I had that in the automated system, um, our robot was able to pipette into that very quickly. Uh, the reagents that come with WES were actually much easier to work with on the robot. Uh, some of the older reagents were a little bit difficult to resuspend, and it seems like you guys have actually uh, improved a lot of those things so the, the robot can successfully and consistently uh, deal with those reagents and, and easily pipette them into the new plate. Thanks, Catherine. Andrea, I have a question for you. Um, can I run only 10 samples in the WES? So our cartridges come, again, like um, Catherine just said, 25 capillaries per cartridge. Um, you can have some of those capillaries be empty um, and run less samples, or you could use the additional capillaries for replicates. Um, we also offer a 13 capillary cartridge for those who don't necessarily need that many samples. And so someone running 10 samples could easily use our 13 capillary cartridge as an alternative. All right, Andrea, I have another question about capillaries. This one is how the capillary tube having protein separated treated with primary and secondary antibodies. So our capillaries, when you first get them, are not filled with anything. Um, the separation matrix is actually a free-flowing solution. And so we aspirate that into the capillary with, using vacuum, um, cause the separation to occur, and then immobilize the protein. Once the protein has been immobilized, we can use, again, the vacuum to remove everything that hasn't been immobilized, so the separation matrix, stacking matrix, which leaves an empty lumen that we can now flush the primary and secondary antibody through the capillary um, using, again, the vacuum. All right, Catherine, I'm back to you. How long did it take you to automate the entire protein analysis workflow? So the actual uh, automation of the simple Western part of it was relatively quick and easy because it is good <coughs> handling. Uh, we're not moving any complicated solutions. We had to do a little bit of work in terms of optimization uh, for pipetting small volumes, but our robot is able to handle pretty small volumes, and uh, the volumes that we're dealing with are all above one microliter, so uh, it was pretty easy to do. Um, we also automated all of the cell lysis and protein preparation steps, which took a little bit longer, uh, mostly because our robot does not have a centrifuge integrated into it, and so we had to figure out a way of filtering the protein lysate away from any cell debris. And that just took a little bit of time of experimenting with a couple different kinds of filter plates that we were able to get samples of. Um, so probably in terms of absolute time, we uh, likely had the simple Western side of things up and running within, uh, I'd say, less than a week, just a couple of days. Uh, but the protein uh, lysate clearance took a little bit longer 
um, maybe total time of about a month, including time to get samples of filter plates in from different vendors. Thank you. Um, Andrea, we're back to you again. Do I need to prepare my sample in any special way? So the preparation of the simple Western sample is very similar to what you do with a traditional Western blot. You would add a sample buffer that has denaturing and reducing agents into it. We do provide sample buffers um, in our kit that you would receive with the plates and cartridges. And it also includes a fluorescent standard that you would add to the sample. Um, but it's a very quick um, process. I think it's about five or six steps where you just add the sample buffer, DTT, the fluorescent standards, and then boil, um, very similar to what you do for a traditional Western. Okay, Andrea, another question for you. What is the maximum volume of sample that can be loaded? So in a plate, we will load five microliters of sample, and what gets loaded into the capillary using our default um, conditions is approximately 40 nanoliters. That being said, you can adjust the vacuum time so that you load a little more into the capillary. Um, we haven't done the exact studies to know exactly how much is going into the caps, but I would say roughly around 40 nanoliters, give or take um, 10 nanoliters or so. But we haven't had, seemed to have an issue with um, not being able to load enough protein. We have pretty good sensitivity on the instrument. All right, another one for you. What percent of antibodies that have worked with traditional Western have you seen not work with the West? So with all antibodies, some will work for some applications and they won't work with others. I think, um, you know, we'd all love antibodies that work for everything. So we did do a very in-depth study um, when building the instrument to have an idea what percentage of antibodies that worked on a traditional Western would also work on West. And we found about 80-90% did transfer over well. Okay. When will the automated SLL system with West integration be available to other labs, e.g. my lab at a university? Well, uh, to be perfectly honest, at Emerald here we've developed the SLL system as an in-house solution for our own experimentation. Uh, it's unclear what we're going to do with it after this. Um, I mean, it's great to use. I could see uh, people would enjoy using it in their own systems, but it's, un it's unclear what the big plans are for it as of now. So um, ask again later. <laughs> Andrea, the next question is, can you store a capillary and probe it at a later date with a different antibody looking at a different protein? So because everything is automated, everything from separation to detection occurs within the instrument. So you would need to probe the capillary at the same time that you set the experiment up. Um, you wouldn't be able to store it, take it out, and then probe it at a later time. Okay, Andrea, there are so many questions for you, um, which is a good thing, I guess, right? How many different proteins do you evaluate within a given amount of time? Oh, I think that is a question that depends on um, your needs um, for the customer. I think, you know, it depends how many targets you need to evaluate. Um, because, again, each capillary is a separate capillary and you can um, use a lot of different antibodies in the well. You're not, you know, um, looking at one continuous membrane where if you wanted to look at different antibodies, you'd need to cut strips with scissors. You could look at up to as much as 24, 25 targets um, with a single run. Um, you know, it depends on the customer. Customers who are doing a lot of um, pathway work will look at more targets than someone's interested in a specific target. Um, we did show the Simple Western family. Um, we've specifically talked about West where you can do 25 targets per run. Um, we do, again, have the larger throughput instruments, the Sally Sue and Peggy Sue, which have higher throughput, 96 capillaries per run. And for someone doing more systems biology or um, screening, that's a great platform to get through more targets within a given amount of time. But I think the answer is you can do as many as your research requires. <laughs> Thank you. Andrea, I promise you I'm just going to ask you a couple more questions. Uh, do you need to use loading control with simple Western runs? 
So I think to answer that question, we need to go through some definitions at first. Um, there's biological loading control, so that's something like Actin or GAP-DH that customers will use to um, control whether or not they have loaded the same amount, they've prepared the same amount of sample, um, make sure to take into account any variability that may have happened during um, their protein concentrate, like when they're their BCA assays. Um, that is up to the customer. Um, if they want to, they're more than welcome to do it. Um, from the data that we showed with the system control, you can look at multiple targets in one capillary. They just need to be of distinct molecular weight, and you're more than welcome to use a system control if you want to take into any account any, um, any imprecision when either preparing the sample or determining the concentration of the sample. And then you can also use the system control. So again, this is more of a uh, control for the actual system and not so much for the sample. Um, and again, you are more than welcome to. It's up to you. Um, we recommend it just because it gives you some more precision, but um, you don't have to use it if for whatever reason you don't want to. Okay, Andrea, a listener wants to know, can I multiplex with Simple Western? Uh, so yes, so you can multiplex so long as the proteins are of distinct molecular weight. Um, because this is a chemiluminescent detection, if the proteins co-migrate, you're not going to be able to distinguish. But if you can separate them, um, you can definitely multiplex. Um, internally, we've multiplexed up to four or five proteins at a given time. You just need to ensure that your antibodies all have pretty clean background um, in order to do the multiplexing. All right, Andrea, this is the final question. How does antibody dilution used for detection affect the results? So the dilution of your antibody in simple Western, again, will be very similar to what diluting an antibody in a traditional Western would be like. So if you use too much antibody, you'll have more background. And if you don't have enough, you won't necessarily have the most optimized signal. The one thing, though, with the simple Western is because we are more quantitative, it is important to do um, use a concentration or a dilution of your antibody where you know that you're getting saturation of the binding of the antibody to the sample so that any differences that you're seeing are due to differences in the protein amount in your sample and not due to differences in the amount of antibody you have present between capillaries. Okay, unfortunately our time is up, but I don't think we can ask Andrea to answer any more questions. Um, thanks for listening in, and thanks for all the great questions. This webinar will be archived for six months on our website, www.genengnews.com. If you missed parts of it, you can watch it again, or you can recommend it to friends and colleagues. Once again, I want to thank our panel. Thank you so much, Catherine and Andrea, as well as our sponsor, Protein Simple. Thank you. Um, and I think we'd also like to note that the webinar will also be available on the Protein Simple website um, as well. Great. Thank you.